So it's traditional in this country, or at least it's become traditional, to on the nation's birthday on July 4th, to talk about liberty and freedom. We're going to do that today, except that today's not the fourth, is it? No. Today's the second. the second. So that raises the interesting question. Did anything liberty, freedom related ever happen on a July 2 in this world? I believe it did. In fact, uh, President John Adams declared that July 2 would be uh, epical, E-P-O-C-H-A-L, day in history for all time. It would be celebrated with parades, bands, and fireworks. Wow. Okay. So did anything formal actually ever happen on a July 2? As a matter of fact, on July 2, 1776, the Second Continental Congress adopted the resolution proposed by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia that, quote, these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, end quote. Nearly 50 years later, mm -hmm. something similar happened further south. That was the day, July 2, 1823, when Brazil fought its final successful battle against their colonial overlords, Portugal. So today in Brazil is a very big day. Shortly after that, on July 2, 1839, 53 people from Africa who had been sold as slaves in Havana, Cuba, took control of their ship, Amistad, and sued for their freedom through their attorney, John Quincy Adams. And to the dismay of the sitting president, Martin Van Buren, the U.S. Supreme Court, just a story writing for the majority, ordered the slaves freed and returned to their homeland. On July 2, 1863, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union held on to the high ground of Cemetery Ridge, in particular the spots known as Little Round Top and Big Round Top, under constant assault by the Confederate Army, and set the stage for the next day which would bring the Union victory and the turning point of the Civil War. At the end of the next enormous conflict that our country was involved in, World War I, on July 2, 1921, President Harding signed the resolution that formally ended the war between the United States and Imperial Germany. Many years later, the first strike for freedom of price shopping hit when Walmart opened the very first one in 1962. A couple of years later on July 2, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill, making it the Civil Rights Act, passed by Congress, taking a huge step towards freeing discrimi from discrimination, make it illegal, in fact, to discriminate in the workplace and in businesses of public accommodation based on what today we should be calling ethnicity. Back then, they called it race, color, gender, or national origin. And in 2001, on July 2, the very first artificial heart was implanted in a patient. And today, July 2, 2016, God provides for our freedom and invites us to accept his gift. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The, in the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. During World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave a speech 
which he titled The Four Freedoms. We're going to hear a, a little perspective, not the content of that speech. That's there to be read on the internet if you have the time and interest. But the ideas are salient, I think, in a spiritual context as well. And it's from that that Richard and I have chosen to uh, take some thoughts. Freedom of speech. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows God's handiwork. So says the psalmist. Whatever we do, Paul writes, should be done to the glory of God. Testifying for God takes on different forms. Some are vocal. Words can educate, enlighten, and ennoble the mind. Some words can be persuasive, settle arguments, and change our way of thinking. The wise man tells us a kind word, fitly spoken, is like apples of gold on settings of silver. Words of encouragement, instruction, and affirmation have prevented countless disasters. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night shows knowledge, emphasis on the shows. Night implies a different witness, one without words. Without words, we listen to the bird's song. We find comfort in the stream's gurgle or the patter of raindrops, especially in this long season of drought. Similarly, dance, painting, architecture, and all the visual arts add to our knowledge of our Creator. Another type of testimony makes an even louder and often stronger point. And I'll bet you know what it is. What speaks louder than words? Actions. And David agrees. A kind wink or smile, a hug, mowing a neighbor's lawn, leaving flowers or home-baked goodies on a friend's doorstep are actions which will likely remain in the recipient's mind for quite some time. Each person on the giving end knows how great it feels to do such kindnesses. Each person on the receiving end knows that they matter and are appreciated. Even without using speech or language, the story the heavens share has a voice. Their line has gone out into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world, day unto day and night unto night. Every moment of our existence, the cosmos tell us through their appointed gifts of light and rest that God is life, that God is beauty, and that God is love. So what do we, the people, say about God? On July 4, 1776, a certain document stated, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Over the past 240 years, Many of us have grown to believe that these rights extend to all chromosome sets and ethnicities. God speaks through messages with words and messages without words. And sometimes they happen together. All the morning stars sang together as God's children shouted for joy. We hear instrumental and choral music from composers whose inspiration had to come from beyond what human thought alone could produce. All one has to do is hear the sacred music of masters such as J.S. Bach, Mozart, Brahms, and Beethoven to know the source with a capital S was their reason for inspiration. Freedom of speech is one of the most highly prized individual rights of U.S. citizens. Fighting words, obscenity, words that endanger the lives of others are not, contrary to popular opinion, protected speech. Still, we the people are free to speak well or ill of our government, and we exercise this privilege frequently, 
especially in election years. We value the right to speak about our officials and their behaviors. As a nation, we cherish the opportunities to express our thoughts, even if they reflect a view other than the majority opinion on all manner of matters. Whether through speeches or placards in support of candidates or causes like climate change and fiscal responsibility, we make our will known, particularly through the voting booth. Our money bears our national motto, in God we trust. Yet how many of us spend more time criticizing and complaining or second-guessing God as if we had a better plan? How many of us are willing to hazard our lives for the God who chose to die that we may live? Are we ready to say, as Job did, though God slay me, I will still trust him? How much more sacred is our task to praise God's goodness and greatness? Our spoken and unspoken messages travel throughout the earth. You and I are called to exercise wisdom when we speak and make the most of every chance to lift up God's name. Let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, good flavor, so you can know how to answer everyone. Salt urges us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Praise God for the abundant life both promised and given. Praise God for the divine gift of free choice. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's recipe for happiness. Whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Those references from 1 Thessalonians and Colossians. Again, David exhorts us to call audibles on life's playing field. Declare God's glory among those who do not know him. Praise God according to his excellent greatness. Praise God with the sound of the trumpet, the psaltery, and harp. Praise God with the timbrel and dance with stringed instruments, organ and loud high-sounding cymbals. Let everything and everyone that has breath, and that's you and me, praise the Lord. David concludes Psalm 19 with the petition. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. May this be our daily prayer. Thanks be to God. This morning's second scripture reading is found in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visit us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show prosper, proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Freedom is rarely free. We were reminded a moment ago that it's not just free speech, it's the exercise thereof that makes a difference and that matters. Freedom to worship probably brings with it a responsibility to worship. So I want to share with you a number of scriptures this morning that talk about worship. Why should we worship? John the Revelator suggests, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. As it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. But what if I don't feel like worship today or tomorrow? The prophet Habakkuk had some advice on this. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my Savior. Scripture gives us a number of examples of worship and suggestions on how to worship. The psalmist wrote, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before the decree forbidding it. Then those men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. And later the king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. Paul had some advice. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul wrote to the Hebrews and said this, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he, Jesus, was heard because of his reverence. Later about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. But I will sing of his strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. So praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. 
Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Today's third scripture reading is John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered to him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied to them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Freedom from want. Jesus told the audience who believed on him how to identify themselves as his disciples. They must continue in his word. Jesus' teachings were given as liberating life to all who would hear. Everything he taught was a keeper, not to be relegated to forgotten corners of one's mind or tossed out like yesterday's news. Christ always offered good news in good measure pressed down and overflowing into the bosom of whoever would receive his counsel. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. Notice the verb shall implies both an imperative, necessity, and a future time. None of the people listening had the truth just as no human today has a monopoly on ultimate truth as we sit here. Then like now, many considered the truth a thing to be grasped, an object, an idea of what, if you will. Those things might be fine starts, but they are also finite. To know infinite truth, you must first get acquainted with the who. In John's Gospel, Jesus leaves no doubt about who the who is. Who is reflects one of God's names. Any idea what that is? If you take who is, what does that sound like that we know to be one of God's names? I am. Jesus states plainly, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And in so doing, he introduces three more God names. Way, truth, and light. To know Jesus, one must seek to have a deep relationship with him. Such a friendship needs daily nurture, requires intentional pursuit of happiness, peace, love, and joy. This involves constant care and prayer, communication and communion, creator and created, walking and talking along the stretches, turns, and surprising twists of life's journey. When we begin to know Jesus, the truth, Jesus, liberates us from our preconceived notions to enjoy a full and abundant life. Now some to whom Jesus spoke couldn't believe their ears. They had no metal ball or shackles restricting their movement. How could he suggest that they weren't free? Some of the more pious, likely scribes and Pharisees cried, We are Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to anyone. All I can think is that perhaps they ditched Hebrew school's history classes when they were younger. Or may, maybe they studied a Torah purchased at half price because it was missing the books of Genesis and Exodus. Somehow, 
Israel's slavery experience in Egypt, beginning with Joseph and lasting for more than four centuries, managed to slip their minds. As the lawyers, some of my kinfolk in the crowd, argued their right to hereditary respect as Abraham's seed and genetic offspring, they didn't realize that they had their rights figured wrong. They had no clue the seed with a capital S promised to our first parents was in their midst. Yet Jesus did not give up on them. He pointed out anyone who participates in sin separates himself and herself from God and God's liberty. In fact, such souls who consider their needs superior to those of anyone else, Jesus said, enslave themselves to selfishness, which in short is, guess what? Yes, a sin. If it looks like a sin, if it walks like a sin, if it talks like a sin, it's a what? A sin. Jesus went further by discussing a slave's standing vis-a-vis -vis the master. While a slave may come and go at the master's bidding, even into the master's dwelling, he or she could never claim the master's house as a permanent residence due to a slave's lowly status. Slaves had no reasonable expectation of staying on the property where they were born for their whole lives. By contrast, the master may abide in his house as long as he or she wishes, come or go when he or she pleases, even unto forever. No wonder Jesus would implore us to continue in my word and continue in my love. Jesus shows us the only remedy for self-centeredness is selflessness. Jesus came as a servant of servants to show us how to find true happiness through service. Though today many make careers as domestic servants, in the culture of Jesus' time, servant was just another word for Guess what? Slave, right. Had Jesus not chosen to live a selfless life within the finite limitations of sinful humans, we all would be slaves eternally. God in the person of Jesus came to release us from sin's bondage and set our hearts at liberty when asked to read scripture in the synagogue of his hometown, Jesus chose this passage from Isaiah to announce his mission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. God's choice is for our freedom. The open end is our choice. Will we abide in Jesus as he invites or file God's instructions under, quote, something to use when we deem it convenient, end quote. Life is great when we're really free. Freely, freely, we have received. Let us freely, freely give. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Today's fourth scripture reading is Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 21. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope. 
that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of children of God. Being free from fear. Let's look at scripture again. The psalmist wrote, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble all of its own. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Paul wrote to his friends in Rome, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those are very powerful words, that last bit from Paul to the Romans. Long before that, Moses had come down from the mountain. He had just been told by God that he would not be leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And as Moses was explaining this to the people, he said to Israel, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Moses immediately turned to Joshua and said, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. A couple of days later, after Moses has died, God speaks to Joshua and he says some very deja vu words. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you where you go. Why did Joshua get this counsel, bang, bang, bang? As part of the children of Israel and then directly from Moses and then directly from God, right in a row. Why did Joshua need it three times? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. I, your God, will be with you. Remember back when Joshua and Caleb had been part of the crew that went into the land of Canaan to spy, to get the lay of the land before the invasion was to occur. What did they see when they were out there? They saw amazing milk and honey-like things. Then they saw those, those giants. And when the group came back and reported to Moses, remember how that went? Ten of the twelve said, 
this ain't gonna work. We're in deep trouble. This is, this is just not, not gonna happen. We're all gonna die. And it was only Joshua and Caleb that said, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. What was the response of the gathered multitudes to these two reports? When Moses said, we're going to go through with this, the people picked up stones. The people revolted. They then unrevolted, repented very briefly, and revolted again. Why did Joshua need to hear this be strong and courageous three times? Because his problem was not going to be death nor life, angels or demons, present, future, power, height, depth, anything else in all creation. His problem was us. His problem was his own people, his own family. That's what he had to fear. And that's why God said to him, Joshua, be strong, be courageous. I know you're going to have to divide the inheritance. I know you're going to have to conquer a land with an unwilling people. They will turn against you, Joshua, but that's OK, because I will be there. Be strong and be courageous. So praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort those in any other trouble with the comfort that we had received from our God.